Good afternoon, everyone. It's my great honor to share our work, How BPA++, which will provide a more powerful memory protection than prior work, How BPF presented last year. This is a joint work with Dr. Yue Chen. Unfortunately, he cannot make it here today because he needs to attend a university commencement ceremony. Uh, I am Zicheng Wang, currently a PhD student at Nanjing University and visiting University of Colorado Boulder under the supervision of Dr. Yue Chen. My research focuses on operating system security. Uh, since we are in the Linux security summit, so there is no need to further emphasize the importance of Linux kernel security. Uh, the vulnerability life cycle consists of mainly four steps. The vulnerability introduced, discovered, and the patch merged and developed. Various technology techniques available to protect the Linux kernel, for instance, on the left, tools such as set color and static analysis have been developed to discover kernel vulnerabilities. And on the right, after a patch is available, vulnerabilities can be fixed. However, there is a time window of at least 66 days between the discovery of vulnerability and the patch availability during which the kernel is left vulnerable and unable to protect itself. We haven't seen much practical protection during this period. This is where HotBPF++ came in. Our work is quite straightforward, as HotBPF++ generates eBPF programs automatically to prevent triggering errors without the need for patches. Before we describe all technical details of our work, let me first present its overview. A vulnerability on the error side is triggered by a malicious process through system call. And after the attacker triggers the vulnerability, the entire system will be compromised. Our work, how BPI++ can prevent the vulnerability on the error side from being triggered by loading a BPI program in the kernel space. The BPI program will be executed every time before the error site and check if the current context meets the triggering condition of the vulnerability. If not met, nothing happens, the kernel will keep functioning, but if the error condition is met, the BPL program will help kernel skip the error site and jump to the return of the function, and the send signal kill to stop the malicious process. After that, kernel will return to the normal condition and keep functioning because BPF++ focuses on the accurate error set rather than the entire kernel, so it's lightweight and, uh, and efficiency. Uh, before I dive deeper, I will introduce the input of HotBPF++, a report generated by SetColor. SetColor is the most widely used kernel father developed by Google, which constantly generates randomized new inputs to detect the crashes in the kernel. And the kernel is compiled with sanitizers. On the left, is the set color dashboard. When a corruption is detected, the sanitizer collects the information about the error and report, and report it to the dashboard. We can observe that many types of bugs are reported. On the right is the set color report. The bug report inputs a wealth of information such as the type and the position of the bug and the color trees that il illustrate how the bug instruction was called. In addition to this information, there may also be the proof of concept and the kernel configurations to reproduce the crash. This data help us help our work to identify the error site and construct the triggering condition. Uh, HBBF++ is built on the eBPF, the extended Berkeley packet filter framework. It's an in-kernel virtual machine that allows users with root privileges to load programs into the kernel space. Uh, the BPM framework also includes three essential components, the verifier, the JIT engine, and the help functions. Uh, the verifier is responsible for verifying the installed BPM bytecode and ensure the memory safety, the termination, and the information flow security. Uh, the JIT engine enables eBPF bytecode to be executed just in time for achieving native machine performance. And the helper function 
provides expressive interface between eBPF programs and other kernel subsystems to extend eBPF's feature. eBPF also provides hook mechanism based on the K-probe, which enables the hub EBF plus plus to attach arbitrary error site in the kernel without recompiling the kernel or rebooting. Uh, BPF plus plus leverage these powerful capabilities of our of the framework to detect and prevent the kernel uh, vulnerability with high efficiency. Next, we'll introduce the workflow. Uh, how BPS plus plus take bug reports triggered in the sanitizer kernel. We can see the left top as input and generate the error prevention eBPF program as output. And the workflow includes mainly five steps. The first step is to extract the critical bug information from the report. And the second step is to map the error, site, error information from the sanitizer binary to source code. Because there is no direct mapping from the sanitizer kernel binary to the runtime kernel binary, so we have to use the source code line as a bridge. And the next step is map the error information from the source code to native binary, where we will put BPF program on and detect if the bug triggering condition is met. Both the translation process from sanitizer to native and native to sanitizer based on the kernel debug information, the WOLF. And the fourth step is to construct triggering condition as a native kernel binary, such as check the vulnerability related registers and memory address. Finally, how BPF plus plus synthesizes all the information about and generates the BPF prevention program. Uh, we will use the example to describe the workflow. Uh, this working example is a heap or a slab out of bound vulnerability that can lead to a serious security issue. It is in the kernel security app armor module. The triggering condition for this vulnerability is shown in the line 645, where the length of the array ARGS is defined as size, but you see the index star count from zero. So the last index can be written as size minus one. But in the line 645, the index size is written, so apparently there is a one bit off overflow. Uh, attackers can use this simple overflow to uh, get the root privilege and corrupt the entire system. And uh, how BPS plus plus prevents this error from being triggered by checking if there is an overflow at line 645. If the triggering condition is met, the BPL program helps the kernel skip the line 645 and jumps direct to the line 693, returning the error code. This makes the kernel believe that the function has failed and executes the error handler in the call stack until return to the system call. Next, we will use this vulnerability to show how the BVL program generates, how the how BVL plus plus generates BVL program from the bug report. To generate the program, we need to locate the error size in the runtime kernel binary, where we can, as, as shown in the workflow on the laptop, also we have a report collected from the size called sanitizer kernel, as I described in the technical background. There is no direct mapping between the sanitizer kernel and the native kernel binary. Therefore, we use the source code line to bridge the two binaries. We can use regex to extract that the vulnerability is a slab, slab out of bound error and triggered and triggered at the address of the function app armor set proc attribute plus hex 116. We first locate the error site in the source code line using the sanitize the binary debug info. Then we use the debug information to locate the error instruction in the native kernel where we can check if the error condition is met. The result show the probe address is function app armor set proc attribute plus hex 8f in native kernel. And number zero will be written to the address register RSI plus, plus RDI times one. 
after locating the error set in the runtime kernel binary. The next step of hot BBS++ is cons construct the triggering condition to detect if the vulnerability is triggered. For this case, the triggering condition is when the pointer address is out of the legit, legit range of the object it refers to. The pointer referred address is calculated use the register RSI plus RDI times one. And the RSI is the base address of the pointer and the RD, RDX is the offset of the pointer. To get the legit range of the object, we implement new BPF helper function to get the start address and the length of the object when we have the base address stored in the register RSI. The last step is to synthesize all the information and generate the BPI program. The BPI program is probed exactly on the AppArmor setproc attribute plus hex uh, 8F, just the way presented. And every time when the CPU is going to execute the instruction, the program, the BPI program will be executed first to detect if the triggering condition is met. Uh, we present the sample code of the BPI program. First, the, the program obtains the object's runtime size, and then check if the error condition is triggered, and uh, last, the program, if the triggering condition is met, the program skips the error site and uh, return error code to the caller set, and send a signal kill to the vulnerability user, user space proof of concept program. And we will show a demo how the how the BVI plus plus solve this pro problem, solve this one be sorry. And the demo is on 5.15 kernel version. And the vulnerability CVE 20166187 is important is imported to the kernel because it's too old, but but still working. Uh, first, we will run the proper concept program on the sanitized kernel to, pro to pro corrupt the kernel as we presumed. Uh, is this start? Okay, it start. First, we run the proof of concept program on the sentence kernel to craft the kernel as we presume. As we're shown here, it's the set color report. We build a sanitizer build compare option on it. And here is the error type and the triggering site. Also, we can deduct the, the triggering condition. Uh, then we start the hot BVI plus plus prevent the program from being triggered. On the left side is the proof of concept, and on the right side is the BPF prevention program. We start the right side BPF program first. And then we run the malicious process. Uh, we can see in the left, the, pro the malicious process is killed. And on the right side, the BVI program has detected the error is triggered. After that, after that I run uh, areas to check if the kernel is still keep functioning. Yes, it is a simple demo. And the kernel is still keep functioning. So in, in conclusion, we think there are five advantages of the Hobby Web Plus Plus system. First is protect the kernel when the patches are unavailable. And the Hobby Web Plus Plus is an end to end system. The BPL program is automatically generated from set color reports. And it 
has no interrupt to the kernel execution. The BPL program can be installed on, at the runtime on the fly without recompiling and rebooting the kernel. And uh, it has a negligible performance overhead and memory overhead. Uh, this result will be shown in the later, in the following slides. And it, we have to say it's easy to be extended. We can use it to support, support policies for other vulnerability types. Next, so we will show some technical details. Uh, our work, plus adopts a layered architecture, including the underlying error-independent mechanisms and the overlay error-dependent prevention policies. The underlying error-independent me mechanisms provide the tools and mechanisms to support the policies. It includes the report processor, the sign test to native mapper, and the checkpoint uh, restorer, check analyzer. First, let's talk about the inf infrastructural mechanisms because the report processor is, is very easy. It's a Python script with regex. We'll start from Scientist Mapper. And the key goal of Scientist to native mapper is to translate the error site from the Scientist binary to the native binary and uh, through the South Code line, uh, as we described earlier. Normally, we can use the uh, address to line to map the binary address to the source code line and source code line to the binary address. But address line is well known to be inaccurate as shown in these examples. One address uh, can often map more than one lines of code and the one source code line can also map several instructions. So the hobby web plus plus only need one specific address in the native kernel binary. The rest are false positives to block our work. So we present our method to improve the accuracy of the transformation flow. Our method is used another translation flow for cross-checking, except the address to source code line and the debug information also include variables to register and register to variable mapping. So only the instruction and the code line share the same operands will be correct. Others are false positives, as shown in the figure. Uh, the variable ARGS is stored in the register RSI as, uh, as this address range. Similarly, the variable size is stored at, in the register RDX, so only the line 465 matches among several options. We have a statistic on more than 20 error sites, according to the result. With our two flow cross checking, the false positive number will reduce from two to zero per case. So, I mean, our, our method can fit the transformation flow. Uh, the next component is underlying layer is the checkpoint and restore. HubBWF uses, HubBWF Plata uses component to skip the error set, recover the register, and kill the malicious process. However, in the component, component, we choose not to skip the error instruction because it may break the consistency of the register context. As we can see, the red, red font marks the change the value. The, the context of the registers between instructions are very complex, as we can see in the line 400, 645. But we found an easier case when skip a call instruction the only register change to the call E is the REX, and REX is used to store the return, return value. So we choose jump to the return instruction and skip the entire function to keep the register contact consistency. Uh, we set up a checkpoint to require the register at the function entry, and when the error condition is met, how BPF++ will restore the register contacts at the function exit and assign an error code to the RAX and keep the register context uh, consistency. The rest of the function will treat the, the rest of function in the call stack will treat this function field, execution field, and uh, leverage their error handlers to keep the system functioning. 
Uh, except for, for the function skip, there are also about 500 pairs of operations as the function entries that need to be recovered in the function exit, such as spin lock, the locks, uh, the memory allocation, the global memory modification, device ready, and so on. Uh, so on the right side, this function uses spin lock and uh, allocate memory as a function entry and uh, unlock and free as the exit. So the BPI plus plus want to jump to the return. We have to unlock the spin lock. Otherwise, the kernel will be deadlocked. There are related work on the kernel status recovery, so we don't uh, see more details here. Our work temporarily focused on solving the lock problem. Other pairs may not corrupt the kernel. We also test the robustness of our solution, the temporal solution. And uh, the kernel keep working on daily tasks for weeks. And nothing serious happens. The kernel will keep functioning. After the mechanisms, let's talk about policies. Uh, the overlay error dependent prevention policies are designed based on the triggering conditions of each type of the vulnerability. How BPI++ prevent, provide the templates of the BPI program for automatic generation? I will show more technical details to help better understand how to extend BPI++ to other error types. And to extend the new error types, how the BPI++ need, to, need templates of the triggering condition for new error type, and maybe some new BPI helper functions to support the template. For example, we use out of bound error in the previous slide. Uh, the triggering condition is out of bound, mainly include two styles, as we can see the triggering condition template one and two. Uh, the first style is the pointer plus offset style. It is the same type of the CVE we just showed before, just showed previously. Uh, the the address has to be in the pointer's legit range. And similarly, uh, in the, the, the second tr uh, triggering template is memory copy style. There is a destination, there is a source, and there is a length. Also includes so something like memory, memory side, uh, as string copy string side. And to help obtain the range, we implement get buffer start and the length help fu helper functions. We obtain the legit range of slab, body, vimalock, objects uh, at the runtime. And for the rest conditions, such as global, uh, static objects, or arrays on the stack, we can sta statically get them because uh, their size is statically allocated at the, at the function start and will not change in the runtime. Uh, extending to other types of errors adopt the similar method. So we first need to design the template according to the triggering condition. And uh, also design related helper functions to support the template. Now BPL++ can support uh, these policies. Uh, out of bound access, as we just said, and the use of the free, the integer overflow. Uh, data race, uh, uninitialized memory, uh, web pointer access, and user memory access. For integer overflow, we can simulate the calculation op operations in six bit operands. Because most, uh, most uh, integer overflow we see now is are, are, are 32, 32 bits operands. And the data race, we can use a PV operation to record the usage of the race data. And once we find the data race, we, we may kill both the race uh, processes. And for the unusual memory, we can record the memory at the creation site. And uh, when you, and, and the user, we will compare it, make it a comparison. Next, we'll show a more complex policy, the use of the free. Although most cases are straightforward, user-free vulnerabilities are very complex than the out of bound and other error types because it have no straightforward solutions. It's a temporal memory corruption. The triggering condition of user-free is that the pointer is a dangling pointer. 
Tangling point is a pointer referred to a free object. And the dangling pointer is dereferenced by the attacker to read and write the free memory. So we can use a quarantine and sweeping method to prevent the dangling pointer from being triggered. The policy is here. Uh, first, we quarantine the free object until no pointer, dangling pointer exists. We quarantine it by not free it. But it requires its address. And we periodically sweep the entire physical memory for dangling pointers. To, uh, to uh, confirm there is no dangling pointer exists. Uh, we also design optimization that Hot BUI plus plus sweeper can only sweep the certain set catches because we have researched on several errors. Uh, in most cases, the dangling pointer will be stored in another yeah, another step object. Uh, the rest, uh, rest of physical memory, except the step, catch, step catches, will not store the dangling pointers. So this is optimization. Uh, after technical details, we will evaluate the performance of Hot BPI++. Uh, our work has a good performance overhead because uh, it is lightweight and only focusing on the specific error condition, not the entire kernel. So we design experiments to make a full evaluation. First, we collect uh, set color reports and the CVEs, especially for the CVEs. Uh, we also need proof of concept programs to reproduce the error condition report. So we, we collect the proof of concept program and run it in the same kernel. Then we evaluate the, these tasks, uh, including the performance overhead, uh, the performance scalability, and the optimal physical memory sweeper, sweeping period and range for the UAF sweeper. This table shows the result compared to the vanilla kernel. The result include the slab out of bound, the page stack global out of bound, and the use of the free, including two cases the optimizer sweeper and the full physical memory sweeper and uh, integer overflow. The overhead is negligible, result from minus 3% to about 4%. And uh, the benchmark selection includes uh, OS core primitives, such as OS bench and the uh, perf, perf bench. They calculate the overhead of system calls uh, of network, networking and so, so on, these core primitives. And the CPU uh, and the calculation intensive benchmarks, including the OpenSSL, the MP3 encoding, and the GIMP. The L intensive workload, including the Circulite database, the Verga Ver stress for the networking L intensive. Uh, the rest are common server tasks, uh, including Git, uh, kernel compile, uh, compression, uh, Apache, and NGX. The average is showing in the circle. I think the average, the average overhead is acceptable. Only use after free is a little high because we have to need, we have to run a sweeper periodically. But overall it's practical. Next, we also evaluate the scalability. The scalability means the performance overhead when multiple BPI program we execute at the same time. Uh, in this figure, we can see each line in the figure legend represents a, represent a benchmark overhead. When we apply more than 20 BPF, hot BPF plus plus program, in most cases, the worst overhead is less than 8%. But there are special cases. Here, it's about 20 or 30%. How do you have, it is because there is a vulnerability, maybe it's a global, it's a Wimlock out of bound. It hooks on the NAPI interface, NAPI PO interface of the network, in, network, network interface, which is called very frequently under the high concurrency web server requests. So high concurrency benchmark like Apache and Nginx behave not so good. But the rest benchmarks are still acceptable, I think. 
We also evaluate the optimal sweeping period and range in use of the free whole physical memory sweeper. The range is from 128 megabytes to 512 megabytes. And the period rate is from one second per sweep to eight seconds per sweep. Apparently, we have circled the optimal performance. The 256 megabytes every four seconds have the optimal overhead. Overall, we are very honored to share our work to the community. Uh, it's my first uh, time to attend. Uh, how BVI Plus Plus is uh, kernel protection before the patches are available. And we have achieved such contributions. Uh, uh, we have achieved uh, a set call report processor to extract uh, debug information, a sanitized to native mapper to translate the error, condi error condition and error site, a checkpoint restore analyzer to keep the kernel functioning, and a set of policy templates and helper functions for various vulnerability types. Finally, a thorough evaluation of the overhead and scalability. Uh, I hope the community like our work, like our contribution. And also we designed this Q logo generated by Mid-Journey AI. Uh, that's all, too fast. Any questions, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, you said you identified, um, I don't remember how many it was, but uh, function pairs that need to be unwound. Uh, but it sounded like you said you're only handling the lock on lock cases right now? Yes. And, and were you looking also at like data structure invariants that might get violated halfway through a function or is, is that still also future work? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's a little ad hoc here, but it's not our main contribution. Is there a way for users to modify the, BP, the generated BPF programs, or is there any support for that? Yes, we, we can, we can BPF say programs. more guidance on this ad hoc checkpoint and restore. Great. Thank you. This might be a similar question. Um, on the example you gave uh, in slide eight, with the string truncation going past the end, yeah. is it, can you add other uh, other actions besides just the return? For example, um, in that case, you know, work has happened in a function, and you get to a point, and you're like, ah, I shouldn't do this, but you've left the string unterminated. Can you, before the return, this is sort of like unwinders, basically, you know, write to the memory, write a null to one below the size, so you have a terminated string before you then return an error. Sort of like a custom uh, return handler, I guess. Uh, sorry, I'm not quite clear. Do you mean here? Yeah, if you look at slide eight. Is it you mean here? Yes, in yes. slide eight. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, here like you, you, some work has occurred before you yes. return, before you hit the arg size equals null. Um, is, are you able to add additional things in these in these types of cases where you say, well, what I want to do before I return an error is say args size minus one equals null and now return, so you don't leave uh, some potentially fragile thing in a, in a in a bad state. I mean, it's it's similar to the unlock and yes. all these other things. It, so can that be done in, in an arbitrary fashion right now, or is there work to be done there? Uh, I have I understand. That's a good idea, first I have to say, but we want a, a automatic tool, but it's about a little ad hoc. Okay. We have tested if we just uh, do nothing but return to the error, return instruction and uh, assign an error code, it will still keep functioning. But I think it's, it's an ad hoc, it's temporal. Okay. It's not a full recovery we have. Right. Okay. Yes. Hi. Um, 
in the um, slide you showed where um, you showed the actual output BPF code, uh, I believe you had a helper in there, uh, BPF set regs or something to actually set, uh, you know, uh, set the return value. Uh, that, I'll correct me if I'm wrong, that to my knowledge is not a standard helper. Do you have to load a kernel module to define that as a new helper? Sorry? Do you, the, so the, uh, when you, uh, how, how do you actually set the return value? Do you use an existing BPF helper or do you have to define a new uh, BPF helper? Yes, I, we have to design, define a new helper function. Uh, BPF currently do not support to modify the kernel very rapidly. So I have to add a new helper function such as set the context, register context to make it, to assign an error code. Okay, and you load a kernel module to do that, I take it, or how, do you patch the kernel? How, how, how do you do that exactly? No, no, I just directly patch the kernel. Oh, you just directly patch the kernel, okay, gotcha. Yes, BPF helper function cannot be extended through modules because you have to modify some kernel code in the BPF, maybe the directory, uh, in, under the kernel directory. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your great presentation. Uh, I like your idea, but uh, I have a question about your uh, evaluation part. So, for uh, I remember there are 16 errors, uh, in, and uh, the overhead increase a lot. So, I, I wonder how you know uh, figure out the root cause of those uh, overhead. Uh, yeah, yes, first let me make a simple explanation. The error condition and the root cause of a vulnerability are different. The triggering condition is where the error triggered. For example, uh, integer overflow. The trigger condition is the instruction that triggers the integer overflow. But the actual root cause maybe is earlier in the call chain. There is less lack of check. And for your, uh, for your pr problem, for your question, sorry. Uh, the root cause here is we, we have sampled the execution of this BVF program by dumping its call trace. We have found it is called by through NAPVI Pro. If you currently execute a high concurrency work, network workload, this function will be called fre very frequently. So, and the, the, the the case, the one big, the one BT, the BPF program, hook on this call tree, so it also executes very frequently and causes the overhead. Thank you. Um, so in light of some of the questions that people had earlier about, you know, are there states that you could leave uh, when doing the sort of checkpoint and restore approach. Yes. Um, have you all considered running syscaller on the patched version of the kernel? See if um, additional crash circumstances come up from that? Uh, yes, we, we have also a, to make a simple evaluation of your questions. We just modify a little of the proof of concept program. So it will execute on the, on the error side but the parameter will not tr trigger the error condition. And uh, there is nothing happens, everything good. I'm thinking of like other conditions that might have now been turned into a potential crash or bug of some kind as a result of the uh, hotfix. Uh, we haven't seen, we haven't had those cases, maybe exist, thank you. Thanks. So if I understand correctly, <clears throat> what you, you're basically trying to achieve is uh, you're modifying the execution in runtime to like step over or uh, the the issue. Uh, have you have you considered so si since you know what end result you want to achieve, so you know how the f the function should uh, should be executed in runtime. There is certain instruction you want to jump. You can generate the the 
modified by a function by copying that original function, modifying instruction in the way you want, and then using the live patch infrastructure to replace the, the old function. So won't this give you better performance compared to like, uh, doing the breakpoints with eBPF? Like replacing do, the do old hash? Yeah, the, so, sin, yep. so I understand the advantage of this compared to like actually doing the patch is that you can automatically uh, generate the BPF program that jumps, the, that, that fixes the bug. But using the same infrastructure, you can generate the updated function to do the same. Does it make sense to use yeah. live patch? I, I know your question. Here is the problem. The hot patch and the hot BPF plus plus works in the different period. Uh, hot BPF plus plus work come in when no patches are available. But the hot patch, you, you at least need, to, need a patch, right? Correct, but you essentially, you generate, you can generate the patch using the same uh, workflow um, that you have. As I, as I explained previous, the triggering condition and the root cause is different, right? If you need to fix the vulnerability, you need, you need to analyze the root cause, and the root cause is very complex. But if you just prevent the error condition, it can be deducted through an automatic tool. Is it clear? Yes, but uh, so using the same automatic tool, you can create the new function, just instead of the patching it, uh, instead of having the BPF breakpoint, which, which may have uh, extra overhead, you can create a new function and replace that the whole function. All right, I, I understand what you mean. Uh, but there, there is a limitation on the BPF. Actually, the original BPF uh, merely support only a little modification to the kernel. Actually, it, it didn't support the, the, this it's not a Turing. It's a Turing, not a Turing complete machine. Maybe mm -hmm. so, uh, I, I, I can I can modify the kernel data as many as I want. So I can I cannot just uh, implement a new function to fix this problem because the BPF program is running a virtual machine and is limited. Is it clear? Yeah, I think so. Thank you so much.